Chapter Five, Part Five of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter Five: Tendencies in American. Part Five: Processes of Word Formation. Some of these tendencies it has been pointed out go back to the period of the first growth of american and were inherited from the english of the time they are the products of a movement which reaching its height in the english of elizabeth was dammed up at home so to speak by the rise of linguistic self-consciousness toward the end of the reign of anne but continued almost unobstructed in the colonies for example, there is what philologists call the habit of back formation, a sort of instinctive search, etymologically unsound, for short roots in long words. This habit in Restoration days precipitated a quasi-English word, mobile, from the Latin mobile vulgus and in the days of William and Mary it went a step further by precipitating mob from mobile mob is now sound english but in the eighteenth century it was violently attacked by the new sect of purists and though it survived their onslaught they undoubtedly greatly impeded the formation and adoption of other words of the same category but in the colonies the process went on unimpeded save for the feeble protests of such stray pedants as witherspoon and boucher rattler for rattlesnake pike for turnpike draw for drawbridge coon for raccoon possum for opossum cuss for customer cute for acute squash for aska to squash these american back formations are already antique sabbath day for sabbath day has actually reached the dignity of an archaism to this day they are formed in great numbers scarcely a new substantive of more than two syllables comes in without bringing one in its wake we have thus witnessed within the past two years the genesis of scores now in wide use and fast taking on respectability phone for telephone gas for gasoline co-ed for co-educational pop for populist frat for fraternity gym for gymnasium movie for moving picture prep school for preparatory school auto for automobile aero for aeroplane some linger on the edge of vulgarity pep for pepper flu for influenza Plut for plutocrat, pen for penitentiary, con for confidence, as in con man, con game, and to con, convict and consumption, defy for defiance, butte for beauty, rep for reputation, stenog for stenographer, ambish for ambition, vag for vagrant, champ for champion hard for partner coke for cocaine simp for simpleton diff for difference others are already in perfectly good usage smoker for smoking car diner for dining car sleeper for sleeping car oleo for oleomargarine hypo for hyposulfate of soda yank for yankee confab for confabulation memo for memorandum pop concert for popular concert ad for advertisement is struggling hard for recognition some of its compounds that is ad writer want ad display ad ad card ad rate column ad and ad man are already accepted in technical terminology boob for booby promises to become sound american in a few years its synonyms are no more respectable than it is. At its heels is bow for hobo. 
an altogether fit successor to bum for bummer a parallel movement shows itself in the great multiplication of common abbreviations americans as a rule says farmer employ abbreviations to an extent unknown in europe this trait of the american character is discernible in every department of the national life and thought o k c o d n g g o p which is get out and push and p d q are almost national hallmarks the immigrant learns them immediately after damn and go to hell thornton traces n g to eighteen forty c o d and p d q are probably as old as for o k it was in use so early as seventeen ninety but it apparently did not acquire its present significance until the twenties originally it seems to have meant ordered recorded during the presidential campaign of eighteen twenty eight jackson's enemies seeking to prove his illiteracy alleged that he used it for all correct o l l k o r r e c t of late the theory has been put forward that it is derived from an indian word oke signifying so be it and dr woodrow wilson is said to support this theory and to use oke in endorsing government papers but i am unaware of the authority upon which the etymology is based bartlett says that the figurative use of a number one as in a number one man also originated in america but this may not be true there can be little doubt however t b for tuberculosis g b for grand bounce twenty three on the q t and d and d for drunken disorderly the language breeds such short forms of speech prodigiously every trade and profession has a host of them they are innumerable in the slang of sport what one sees under all this account for it as one will is a double habit the which is at bottom sufficient explanation of the gap which begins to yawn between english and american particularly on the spoken plane on the one hand it is a habit of verbal economy a jealous disinclination to waste two words on what can be put into one a natural taste for the brilliant and succinct a disdain of all grammatical and lexicographical daintiness born partly perhaps of ignorance but also in part of a sound sense of their imbecility and on the other hand there is a high relish and talent for metaphor in brander matthew's phrase a figurative vigor that the elizabethans would have realized and understood just as the american rebels instinctively against such parliamentary circumlocutions as i am not prepared to say and so much by way of being just as he would fret under the forms of english journalism with its reporting empty of drama its third person smothering of speeches and its complex and unintelligible jargon just so in his daily speech and writing he chooses terseness and vividness whenever there is a choice and seeks to make one when it doesn't exist footnote the classic example is in a parliamentary announcement by sir robert peel when that question is made to me in a proper time in a proper place under proper qualifications and with proper motives i will hesitate long before i will refuse to take it into consideration End footnote. there is more than mere humorous contrast between the famous placard in the washroom of the british museum these basins are for casual ablutions only and the familiar sign at american railroad crossings stop look listen between the two lies an abyss separating two cultures two habits of mind two diverging tongues it is almost unimaginable that an englishman journeying up and down in elevators would ever have stricken the teens out of their speech 
turning sixteenth into simple six and twenty-fourth into four the clipping is almost as far from their way of doing things as the climbing so high in the air nor have they the brilliant facility of americans for making new words of grotesque but penetrating tropes as in corn-fed tightwad bonehead bleachers and juice for electricity when they attempt such things the result is often lugubrious two hundred years of schoolmastering has dried up their inspiration nor have they the fine american hand for devising new verbs to mafic and to limehouse are their best specimens in twenty years and both have an almost pathetic flatness their business with the language indeed is not in this department they are not charged with its raids and scoutings but with the organization of its conquests and the guarding of its accumulated stores for the student interested in the biology of language as opposed to its paleontology there is endless material in the racy neologisms of american and particularly in its new compounds and novel verbs nothing could exceed the brilliancy of such inventions as joyride highbrow road louse sob sister nature faker stand patter lounge lizard hash foundry buzz wagon has been end seat hog shoot the shoots and grape juice diplomacy they are bold they are vivid they have humor they meet genuine needs joyride i note is already going over into english and no wonder there is absolutely no synonym for it to convey its idea in orthodox english would take a whole sentence and so too with certain single words of metaphorical origin barrel for large and illicit wealth pork for unnecessary and dishonest appropriations of public money joint for illegal liquor house tenderloin for gay and dubious neighborhood most of these and of the new compounds with them belong to the vocabulary of disparagement here an essential character of the american shows itself his tendency to combat the disagreeable with irony to heap ridicule upon what he is suspicious of or doesn't understand the rapidity with which new verbs are made in the united states is really quite amazing two days after the first regulations of the food administration were announced to hooverize appeared spontaneously in scores of newspapers and a week later it was employed without any visible sense of its novelty in the debates of congress and had taken on a respectability equal to that of to byronize to fletcherize and to oslerize to electrocute appeared inevitably in the first public discussion of capital punishment by electricity to taxi came in with the first taxicabs to commute no doubt accompanied the first commutation ticket to insurge attended the birth of the progressive balderdash of late the old affix eyes i z e once fecund of such monsters as to funeralize has come into favor again and i note among its other products to belgiumize to vacationize to picturize and to scenarioize in a newspaper headline i even find to s o s in the form of its gerund many characteristic american verbs are compounds of common verbs and prepositions or adverbs with new meanings imposed compare for example to give and to give out to go back and to go back on to beat and to beat it to light and to light out 
to butt and to butt in to turn and to turn down to show and to show up to put and to put over to wind and to wind up sometimes however the addition seems to be merely rhetorical as in to start off to finish up to open up and to hurry up to hurry up is so commonplace in america that everyone uses it and no one notices it but it remains rare in england up seems to be essential to many of these latter-day verbs for example to pony up to doll up to ball up without it they are without significance nearly all of them are attended by derivative adjectives or nouns cut up show down kick in come down hang out start off run in balled up dolled up wind up bang up turn down jump off in many directions the same prodigal fancy shows itself for example in the free interchange of parts of speech in the bold inflection of words not inflected in sound english and in the invention of wholly artificial words the first phenomenon has already concerned us when an english literary critic of any pretensions employs such a locution as all by her lonesome i have doubt of it and yet i find that phrase in a serious book by the critic of the new republic would an english m p use he has another thing coming in debate again i doubt it but even more anarchistic dedications of verbs and adjectives to substantival use are to be found in the congressional record every day jitney is an old american substantive lately revived a month after its revival it was also an adjective and before long it may also be a verb and even an adverb to lift up was turned tail first and made a substantive and is now also an adjective and a verb joyride became a verb the day after it was born as a noun and what of livest an astounding inflection indeed but with quite sound american usage behind it the metropolitan magazine of which colonel roosevelt is an editor announces on its letter paper that it is the livest magazine in america and poetry the organ of the new poetry movement prints at the head of its content page the following encomium from the new york tribune the livest art in america today is poetry and the livest expression of that art is in this little chicago monthly now and then the spirit of american shows a transient faltering and its inventiveness is displaced by a banal extension of meaning so that a single noun comes to signify discrete things thus laundry meaning originally a place where linen is washed has come to mean also the linen itself so again gun has come to mean firearms of all sorts and has entered into such compounds as gunman and gunplay and in the same way party has been borrowed from the terminology of the law and made to do colloquial duty as a synonym for person but such evidences of poverty are rare and abnormal the whole movement of the language is toward the multiplication of substantives a new object gets a new name and that new name enters into the common vocabulary at once sunday s u n d a e and hokum are late examples their origin is dubious and disputed but they meet genuine needs and so they seem to be secure a great many more such substantives are deliberate inventions for example kodak protectograph conductorette bevo klaxon vaseline japalac resinol autocar postum crisco electrolier addressograph alabastine orangeade pianola victrola dictograph kitchenette crispet cellaret 
unida triscuit and peptomint some of these indicate attempts at description oleomargarine phonograph and gasoline are older examples of that class others represent efforts to devise designations that will meet the conditions of advertising psychology and the trademarks law to wit that they be a new b easily remembered and c not directly descriptive probably the most successful invention of this sort is kodak which was devised by george eastman inventor of the portable camera so called kodak has so far won acceptance as a common noun that eastman is often forced to assert his proprietary right to it vaseline is in the same position the annual crop of such inventions in the united states is enormous the majority die but a hearty few always survive of analogous character are artificial words of the scalawag and rambunctious class the formation of which constantly goes on some of them are shortened compounds grandificent from grand and magnificent so delicious from soda and delicious and orphanage from war and orphanage footnote this conscious shortening of course is to be distinguished from the shortening that goes on in words by gradual decay as in christmas from christ's mass and daisy from day's eye End footnote others are made up of common roots and grotesque affixes swell doodle splendiferous and picherino yet others are mere extravagant inventions scallywampus super gobsloptious and floozy most of these are devised by advertisement writers or college students and belong properly to slang but there is a steady movement of selected specimens into the common vocabulary the words in doodle hint at german influences and those in eno owe something to italian or at least to popular burlesques of what is conceived to be italian end of chapter five part five Chapter 5, Part 6 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 5, Tendencies in American Pronunciation, Part 6. Language said sace in eighteen seventy nine does not consist of letters but of sounds and until this fact has been brought home to us our study of it will be little better than an exercise of memory the theory at that time was somewhat strange to english grammarians and etymologists despite the investigations of a j ellis and the massive lesson of grimm's law their labors were largely wasted upon deductions from the written word but since then chiefly under the influence of continental philologists and particularly of the dane j o h jesperson they have turned from orthographical futilities to the actual sounds of the tongue and the latest and best grammar of it that of sweet is frankly based upon the spoken english of educated englishmen not remember of conscious purists but of the general body of cultivated folk unluckily this new method also has its disadvantages the men of a given race and time usually write a good deal alike or at all events attempt to write alike but in their oral speech there are wide variations no two persons says a leading contemporary authority upon english phonetics pronounce exactly alike moreover even the best speaker commonly uses more than one style the result is that 
it is extremely difficult to determine the prevailing pronunciation of a given combination of letters at any time and place the persons whose speech is studied pronounce it with minute shades of difference and admit other differences according as they are conversing naturally or endeavoring to exhibit their pronunciation worse it is impossible to represent a great many of these shades in print sweet trying to do it found himself in the end with a preposterous alphabet of one hundred twenty five letters prince l l bonaparte more than doubled this number and ellis brought it to three hundred ninety other phonologists english and continental have gone floundering into the same bog the dictionary makers forced to a far greater economy of means are brought into obscurity the difficulties of the enterprise in fact are probably unsurmountable it is as white says almost impossible for one person to express to another by signs the sound of any word only the voice he goes on is capable of that for the moment a sign is used the question arises what is the value of that sign the sounds of words are the most delicate fleeting and inapprehensible things in nature moreover the question arises as to the capability to apprehend and distinguish sounds on the part of the person whose evidence is given certain german orthoepists despairing of the printed page have turned to the phonograph and there is a deutsche gramophone gesellschaft in berlin which offers records of specimen speeches in a great many languages and dialects including english the phonograph has also been put to successful use in language teaching by various american correspondence schools in view of all this it would be hopeless to attempt to exhibit in print the numerous small differences between english and american pronunciation for many of them are extremely delicate and subtle and only their aggregation makes them plain according to a recent and very careful observer the most important of them do not lie in pronunciation at all properly so called but in intonation in this direction he says one must look for the true characters of the english accent i incline to agree with white that the pitch of the english voice is somewhat higher than that of the american and that it is thus more penetrating the nasal twang which englishmen observe in the vox americana though it has high overtones is itself not high-pitched but rather low-pitched as all constrained and muffled tones are apt to be the causes of that twang have long engaged phonologists and in the main they agree that there is a physical basis for it that our generally dry climate and rapid changes of temperature produce an actual thickening of the membranes concerned in the production of sound we are in brief a somewhat snuffling people and much more given to catars and corizas than the inhabitants of damp britain perhaps this general impediment to free and easy utterance subconsciously apprehended is responsible for the american tendency to pronounce the separate syllables of a word with much more care than an englishman bestows upon them the american in giving extraordinary six distinct syllables instead of the englishman's grudging four may be seeking to make up for his natural disability marsh in his lectures on the english language sought two other explanations of the fact on the one hand he argued that the americans of his day read a great deal more than the english and were thus much more influenced by the spelling of words and on the other hand he pointed out that our flora shows that the climate of even our northern states belongs to a more southern type than that of england and that in southern latitudes articulation is generally much more distinct than in northern regions in support of the latter proposition he cited the pronunciation of spanish italian and turkish 
as compared with that of english danish and german rather unfortunate examples for the pronunciation of german is at least as clear as that of italian swedish would have supported his case far better the swedes debase their vowels and slide over their consonants even more markedly than the english marsh believed that there was a tendency among southern peoples to throw the accent back and that this helped to bring out all the syllables one finds a certain support for this notion in various american peculiarities of stress advertisement offers an example the prevailing american pronunciation despite incessant pedagogical counterblasts puts the accent on the penult whereas the english pronunciation stresses the second syllable paresis illustrates the same tendency the english accent the first syllable but as crop says american usage clings to the accent on the second syllable there are again pianist primarily and telegrapher the english accent the first syllable of each we commonly accent the second in temporarily they also accent the first we accent the third various other examples might be cited but when one had marshalled them their significance would be at once set at naught by four very familiar words mama papa inquiry and ally americans almost invariably accent each on the first syllable englishmen stress the second for months during nineteen eighteen the publishers of the standard dictionary advertising that work in the street cars explained that a lie should be accented on the second syllable and pointed out that owners of their dictionary were safeguarded against the vulgarism of accenting it on the first nevertheless this free and highly public instruction did not suffice to exterminate ally i made note of the pronunciations overheard with the word constantly on all lips but one man of my acquaintance regularly accented the second syllable and he was an eminent scholar professionally devoted to the study of language thus it is unsafe here as elsewhere to generalize too facilely and particularly unsafe to exhibit causes with too much assurance man frage nicht warum says philip karl batman der sprachgebrauch lässt sich nur beobachten but the greater distinctness of american utterance whatever its genesis and machinery is palpable enough in many familiar situations the typical american accent says visitelli is often harsh and unmusical but it sounds all of the letters to be sounded and slurs but does not distort the rest an american for example almost always sounds the first l in fulfill an englishman makes the first syllable foo an american sounds every syllable in extraordinary literary military secretary and the other words of the airy group an englishman never pronounces the a of the penultimate syllable kindness with the d silent would attract notice in the united states in england according to jones the d is very commonly if not usually omitted often in america commonly retains a full t in england it is actually and officially often let an american and an englishman pronounce program me though the englishman retains the long form of the last syllable in writing he reduces it in speaking to a thick triple consonant grum the american enunciates it clearly rhyming it with damn or try the two with any word ending in g say sporting or ripping or with any word having r before a consonant say card harbor 
lord or preferred the majority of englishmen says menner certainly do not pronounce the r just as certainly the majority of educated americans pronounce it distinctly henry james visiting the united states after many years of residence in england was much harassed by this persistent r sound which seemed to him to resemble a sort of morose grinding of the back teeth so sensitive to it did he become that he began to hear where it was actually non-existent save as an occasional barbarism for example in cuber vanillar and california he put the blame for it and for various other departures from the strict canon of contemporary english upon the american common school the american newspaper and the american dutchman and dago unluckily for his case the full voicing of the r came into american long before the appearance of any of these influences the early colonists in fact brought it with them from england and it still prevailed there in dr johnson's day for he protested publicly against the rough snarling sound and led the movement which finally resulted in its extinction today extinct it is mourned by english purists and the poet laureate denounces the clergy of the established church for saying the sod of the laud instead of the sword of the lord but even in the matter of elided consonants american is not always the conservator we cling to the r we preserve the final g we give nephew a clear f sound instead of the clouded english v sound and we boldly nationalize trait and pronounce its final t but we drop the second p from pumpkin and change the m to n we change the f sound to plain p in diphtheria diphthong and naphtha we relieve rind of its final d and in the complete sentence we slaughter consonants by assimilation i have heard englishmen say brand new but on american lips it is almost invariably brand new so nearly universal is this nasalization in the united states that certain american lexicographers have sought to found the term upon bran and not upon brand here the national speech is powerfully influenced by southern dialectical variations which in turn probably derive partly from french example and partly from the linguistic limitations of the negro the latter even after two hundred years has great difficulties with our consonants and often drops them a familiar anecdote well illustrates his speech habit on a train stopping at a small station in georgia a darkey threw up a window and yelled "Wee!" the reply from a black on the platform was "Wee!" a northerner aboard the train puzzled by this inarticulate dialogue sought light from a southern passenger who promptly translated the first question as where is he and the second as where is who a recent viewer with alarm argues that this conspiracy against the consonants is spreading and that english printed words no longer represent the actual sounds of the american language like the french he says we have a marked liaison the borrowing of a letter from the preceding word we invite one another to come here come here who's that who is that has as good a liaison as the french vous avez this critic believes that american tends to abandon t for d as in saturday saturday and sit up sit up and to get rid of h as in where z where is he but here we invade the vulgar speech which belongs to the next chapter among the vowels 
the most salient difference between english and american pronunciation of course is marked off by the flat american a this flat a as we have seen has been under attack at home for nearly a century the new englanders very sensitive to english example substitute a broad a that is even broader than the english and an a of the same sort survives in the south in a few words example master tomato and tassel but everywhere else in the country the flat a prevails fashion and the example of the stage oppose it and it is under the ban of an active wing of schoolmasters but it will not down to the average american indeed the broad a is a banner of affectation and he associates it unpleasantly with spats harvard male tea drinking wrist watches and all the other objects of his social suspicion he gets the flat sound not only into such words as last calf dance and pastor but even into piano and drama drama is sometimes drama west of connecticut but almost never drama or drama tomato with the a of bat may sometimes borrow the a of plate but tomato is confined to new england and the south hurrah in american has also borrowed the a of plate one hears hooray much oftener than hurrah even amen frequently shows that a though not when sung curiously enough it is displaced in patent by the true flat a the english rhyme the first syllable of the word with rate in america it always rhymes with rat the broad a is not only almost extinct outside of new england it begins to show signs of decay even there at all events it has gradually disappeared from many words and is measurably less sonorous in those in which it survives than it used to be a century ago it appeared not only in dance aunt gloss past etc but also in daniel imagine rational and travel and in eighteen fifty seven oliver wendell holmes reported it in matter handsome caterpillar apple and satisfaction it has been displaced in virtually all of these even in the most remote reaches of the back country by the national flat a grand gent says that the broad a is now restricted in new england to the following situations one when followed by s or ns as in lost and dance two when followed by r preceding another consonant as in cart three when followed by l m as in calm four when followed by f s or th as in laugh pass and path the u sound also shows certain differences between english and american usage the english reduce the last syllable of figure to gur the educated american preserves the u sound as in nature the english make the first syllable of courteous rhyme with fort the american standard rhymes it with hurt the english give an oo sound to the u of brusque in america the word commonly rhymes with tusk a u sound as everyone knows gets into the american pronunciation of clerk by analogy with insert the english cling to a broad a sound by analogy with hearth even the latter in the united states is often pronounced to rhyme with dearth the american in general is much less careful than the englishman to preserve the shadowy y sound before u in words of the duke class 
he retains it in few but surely not in new nor in duke blue stew dew duty and true nor even in tuesday purists often attack the simple oo sound in nineteen twelve for example the department of education of new york city warned all the municipal high school teachers to combat it but it is doubtful that one pupil in a hundred was thereby induced to insert the y in induced finally there is lieutenant the englishman pronounces the first syllable left the american invariably makes it loot white says that the prevailing american pronunciation is relatively recent i never heard it he reports in my boyhood he was born in new york in eighteen twenty one the i sound presents several curious differences the english make it long in all words of the hostile class in america it is commonly short even in pural the english also lengthen it in sliver in america the word usually rhymes with liver the short i in england is almost universally substituted for the e in pretty and this pronunciation is also inculcated in most american schools but i often hear an unmistakable e sound in the united states making the first syllable rhyme with bet contrarywise most americans put the short i into bin making it rhyme with sin in england it shows a long e sound as in scene a recent poem by an english poet makes the word rhyme with submarine queen and unseen the o sound in american tends to convert itself into an aw sound cog still retains a pure o but one seldom hears it in log or dog henry james denounces this flatly drawling group in the question of our speech and cites god dog soft loft gone lost and frost as horrible examples but the english themselves are not guiltless of the same fault many of the accusations that james levels at american in truth are echoed by robert bridges in a tract on the present state of english pronunciation both spend themselves upon opposing what at bottom are probably natural and inevitable movements for example the gradual decay of all the vowels to one of neutral color represented by the e of danger the u of suggest the second o of common and the a of prevalent this decay shows itself in many languages in both english and high german during their middle periods all the terminal vowels degenerated to e now sunk to the aforesaid neutral vowel in many german words and expunged from english altogether the same sound is encountered in languages so widely differing otherwise as arabic french and swedish its existence says sais is a sign of age and decay meaning has become more important than outward form and the educated intelligence no longer demands a clear pronunciation in order to understand what is said all these differences between english and american pronunciation separately considered seem slight but in the aggregate they are sufficient to place serious impediments between mutual comprehension let an englishman and an american not of new england speak a quite ordinary sentence my aunt can't answer for my dancing the lancers even passably and at once the gap separating the two pronunciations will be manifest here only the a is involved add a dozen everyday words military 
schedule trait hostel bin lieutenant patent nephew secretary advertisement and so on and the strangeness of one to the other is augmented every englishman visiting the states for the first time said an english dramatist some time ago has a difficulty in making himself understood he often has to repeat a remark or a request two or three times to make his meaning clear especially on railroads in hotels and at bars the american visiting england for the first time has the same trouble despite the fact that american actors imitate english pronunciation to the best of their skill this visiting englishman asserted that the average american audience is incapable of understanding a genuinely english company at least when the speeches are rattled off in conversational style when he presented one of his own plays with an english company he said many american acquaintances after witnessing the performance asked him to lend them the manuscript that they might visit it again with some understanding of the dialogue End of chapter five part six recording by linda johnson chapter six part one of the american language this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the american language by h l mencken chapter six the common speech part one grammarians and their ways so far in the main the language examined has been of a relatively pretentious and self-conscious variety the speech if not always of formal discourse then at least of literate men most of the examples of its vocabulary and idiom in fact have been drawn from written documents or from written reports of more or less careful utterances for example the speeches of members of congress and of other public men the whole of thornton's excellent material is of this character in his dictionary there is scarcely a locution that is not supported by printed examples it must be obvious that such materials however lavishly set forth cannot exhibit the methods and tendencies of a living speech with anything approaching completeness or even with accuracy what men put into writing and what they say when they take sober thought are very far from what they utter in everyday conversation all of us no matter how careful our speech habits loosen the belt a bit so to speak when we speak familiarly to our fellows and pay a good deal less heed to precedents and proprieties perhaps than we ought to it was a sure instinct that made ibsen put bad grammar into the mouth of nora helmar in a doll's house she is a general's daughter and the wife of a professor but even professors wives are not above occasional bogglings of the cases of pronouns and the conjugations of verbs the professors themselves in truth must have the same habit for sometimes they show plain signs of it in print more than once ploughing through profound and interminable treatises of grammar and syntax in preparation for the present work i have encountered the cheering spectacle of one grammarian exposing with contagious joy the grammatical lapses of some other grammarian and nine times out of ten a few pages further on i have found the enchanted purist erring himself the most funereal of the sciences is saved from utter horror by such displays of human malice and fallibility speech itself indeed would become almost impossible 
if the grammarians could follow their own rules unfailingly and were always right but here we are among the learned and their sins when detected and exposed are at least punished by conscience what are of more importance to those interested in language as a living thing are the offendings of the millions who are not conscious of any wrong it is among these millions ignorant of regulation and eager only to express their ideas clearly and forcefully that language undergoes its great changes and constantly renews its vitality these are the genuine makers of grammar marching miles ahead of the formal grammarians like the emperor sigismund each man among them may well say ergo sum super grammaticam it is competent for any individual to offer his contribution his new word his better idiom his novel figure of speech his short cut in grammar or syntax and it is by the general vote of the whole body not by the verdict of a small school that the fate of the innovation is decided as brander matthews says there is not even representative government in the matter the posse comitatus decides directly and despite the sternest protest finally the ignorant the rebellious and the daring come forward with their brilliant barbarisms the learned and conservative bring up their objections and when both sides have been heard there is a show of hands and by this the irrevocable decision of the community itself is rendered thus it was that the romance languages were fashioned out of the wreck of latin the vast influence of the literate minority to the contrary notwithstanding thus it was too that english lost its case inflections and many of its old conjugations and that our yes came to be substituted for the gay sea or so be it of an earlier day and that we got rid of whom after man in the man i saw and that our stark pronoun of the first person was precipitated from the german ich and thus it is that in our own day the language faces forces in america which not content with overhauling and greatly enriching its materials now threaten to work changes in its very structure where these tendencies run strongest of course is on the plane of the vulgar spoken language among all classes the everyday speech departs very far from orthodox english and even very far from any recognizable spoken english but among those lower classes which make up the great body of the people it gets so far from orthodox english that it gives promise sooner or late of throwing off its old bonds altogether or at any rate all save the loosest of them behind it is the gigantic impulse that i have described in earlier chapters the impulse of an egoistic and iconoclastic people facing a new order of life in highly self-conscious freedom to break a relatively stable language long since emerged from its period of growth to their novel and multitudinous needs and above all to their experimental and impatient spirit this impulse it must be plain would war fiercely upon any attempt at formal regulation however prudent and elastic it is often rebellious for the mere sake of rebellion but what it comes into conflict with in america is nothing so politic and hence nothing so likely to keep the brakes upon it what it actually encounters here is a formalism that is artificial illogical and almost unintelligible a formalism borrowed from english grammarians and by them 
brought into english against all fact and reason from the latin in most of our grammars perhaps in all of those issued earlier than the opening of the twentieth century says matthews we find linguistic laws laid down which are in blank contradiction with the genius of the language in brief the american schoolboy hauled before a pedagogue to be instructed in the structure and organization of the tongue he speaks is actually instructed in the structure and organization of a tongue that he never hears at all and seldom reads and that in more than one of the characters thus set before him does not even exist the effects of this are twofold on the one hand he conceives an antipathy to a subject so lacking in intelligibility and utility as one teacher puts it pupils tire of it often they see nothing in it because there is nothing in it and on the other hand the schoolboy goes entirely without sympathetic guidance in the living language that he actually speaks in and out of the classroom and that he will probably speak all the rest of his life all he hears in relation to it is a series of sneers and prohibitions most of them grounded not upon principles deduced from its own nature but upon its divergences from the theoretical language that he is so unsuccessfully taught the net result is that all the instruction he receives passes for naught it is not sufficient to make him a master of orthodox english and it is not sufficient to rid him of the speech habits of his home and daily life thus he is thrown back upon these speech habits without any helpful restraint or guidance and they make him a willing ally of the radical and often extravagant tendencies which show themselves in the vulgar tongue in other words the very effort to teach him an excessively tight and formal english promotes his use of a loose and rebellious english and so the grammarians with the traditional fatuity of their order labor for the destruction of the grammar they defend and for the decay of all those refinements of speech that go with it the folly of this system of course has not failed to attract the attention of the more intelligent teachers nor have they failed to observe the causes of its failure much of the fruitlessness of the study of english grammar says wilcox and many of the obstacles encountered in its study are due to the difficulties created by the grammarians these difficulties arise chiefly from three sources excessive classification multiplication of terms for a single conception and the attempt to treat the english language as if it were highly inflected so long ago as the sixties richard grant white began an onslaught upon all such punditic stupidities he saw clearly that the attempt to treat english as if it were highly inflected was making its intelligent study almost impossible and proposed boldly that all english grammar books be burned of late his ideas have begun to gain a certain acceptance and as the literature of denunciation has grown the grammarians have been constrained to overhaul their texts when i was a schoolboy during the penultimate decade of the last century the chief american grammar was a practical grammar of the english language by thomas w harvey this formidable work was almost purely synthetical it began with a long series of definitions wholly unintelligible to a child and proceeded into a maddening maze of pedagogical distinctions puzzling even to an adult the latter-day grammars at least those for the elementary schools are far more analytical and logical for example there is longman's briefer grammar by george j smith a text now in very wide use 
this book starts off not with page after page of abstractions but with a well-devised examination of the complete sentence and the characters and relations of the parts of speech are very simply and clearly developed but before the end the author begins to succumb to precedent and on page one hundred and fourteen i find paragraph after paragraph of such dull fly-blown pedantry as this some intransitive verbs are used to link the subject and some adjective or noun these verbs are called copulative verbs and the adjective or noun is called the attribute the attribute always describes or denotes the person or thing denoted by the subject verbals are words that are derived from verbs and express action or being without asserting it infinitives and participles are verbals and so on smith in his preface says that his book is intended not so much to cover the subject of grammar as to teach it and calls attention to the fact somewhat proudly that he has omitted the rather hard subject of gerunds all mention of conjunctive adverbs and even the conjugation of verbs nevertheless he immerses himself in the mythical objective case of nouns on page one o eight and does not emerge until the end footnote even sweet though he bases his new english grammar upon the spoken language and thus sets the purists at defiance quickly succumbs to the labeling mania thus his classifications of tenses include such fabulous monsters as these continuous recurrent neutral definite indefinite secondary incomplete inchoate short and long End of footnote. the new webster cooley course in english another popular text carries reform a step further the subject of case is approached through the personal pronouns where it retains its only surviving intelligibility and the more lucid object form is used in place of objective case moreover the pupil is plainly informed later on that a noun has in reality but two case forms a possessive and a common case form this is the best concession to the facts yet made by a textbook grammarian but no one familiar with the habits of the pedagogical mind need be told that its interior pull is against even such mild and obvious reforms defenders of the old order are by no means silent a fear seems to prevail that grammar robbed of its imbecile classifications may collapse entirely wilcox records how the council of english teachers of new jersey but a few years ago spoke out boldly for the recognition of no less than five cases in english why five asks wilcox why not eight or ten or even thirteen undoubtedly because there are five cases in latin most of the current efforts at improvement in fact tend toward a mere revision and multiplication of classifications the pedant is eternally convinced that pigeonholing and relabeling are contributions to knowledge a curious proof in point is offered by a pamphlet entitled reorganization of english in secondary schools compiled by james fleming hosick and issued by the national bureau of education the aim of this pamphlet is to rid the teaching of english including grammar of its accumulated formalism and ineffectiveness to make it genuine instruction instead of a pedantic and meaningless routine and how is this revolutionary aim set forth by a meticulous and merciless splitting of hairs a gigantic manufacture of classifications and subclassifications a colossal display of professional bombast and flatulence i could cite many other examples perhaps after all the disease is incurable 
what such laborious stupidity shows at bottom is simply this that the sort of man who is willing to devote his life to teaching grammar to children or to training school marms to do it is not often the sort of man who is intelligent enough to do it competently in particular he is not often intelligent enough to grapple with the fluent and ever amazing permutations of a living and rebellious speech the only way he can grapple with it at all is by first reducing it to a fixed and formal organization in brief by first killing it and embalming it the difference in the resultant proceedings is not unlike that between a gross dissection and a surgical operation the difficulties of the former are quickly mastered by any student of normal sense but even the most casual of laparotomies calls for a man of special skill and address thus the elementary study of the national language at least in america is almost monopolized by dullards children are taught it by men and women who observe it inaccurately and expound it ignorantly in most other fields the pedagogue meets a certain corrective competition and criticism the teacher of any branch of applied mathematics for example has practical engineers at his elbow and they quickly expose and denounce his defects the college teacher of chemistry however limited his equipment at least has the aid of textbooks written by actual chemists but english even in its most formal shapes is chiefly taught by those who cannot write it decently and who get no aid from those who can one wades through treatise after treatise on english style by pedagogues whose own style is atrocious a huxley or a stevenson might have written one of high merit and utility but huxley and stevenson had other fish to fry and so the business was left to professor balderdash consider the standard texts on prosody vast piles of meaningless words hollow babble about spondees iambics troches and so on idiotic borrowings from dead languages two poets poe and lanier blew blasts of fresh air through that fog but they had no successors and it has apparently closed in again in the department of prose it lies wholly unbroken no first-rate writer of english prose has ever written a textbook upon the art of writing it End chapter six part one chapter six part two of the american language this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 6. The Common Speech. Part 2. Spoken American as it is. But here I wander afield the art of prose has little to do with the stiff and pedantic english taught in grammar schools and a great deal less to do with the loose and lively english spoken by the average american in his daily traffic the thing of importance is that the two differ from each other even more than they differ from the english of a huxley or a stevenson the school marm directed by grammarians labors heroically but all her effort goes for naught the young american like the youngster of any other race inclines irresistibly toward the dialect that he hears at home and that dialect with its piquant neologisms its high disdain of precedent its complete lack of self-consciousness is almost the antithesis of the hard and stiff speech that is expounded out of books it derives its principles not from the subtle logic of learned and stupid men but from the rough and ready logic of every day it has a vocabulary of its own a syntax of its own even a grammar of its own 
its verbs are conjugated in a way that defies all the injunctions of the grammar books it has its contumacious rules of tense number and case it has boldly re-established the double negative once sound in english it admits double comparatives confusions in person clipped infinitives it lays hand on the vowels changing them to fit its obscure but powerful spirit it disdains all the finer distinctions between the parts of speech this highly virile and defiant dialect and not the fossilized english of the schoolmarm and her books is the speech of the middle american of joseph jacob's composite picture the mill hand in a small city of indiana with his five years of common schooling behind him his diligent reading of newspapers and his proud membership in the order of foresters and the knights of the maccabees go into any part of the country north east south or west and you will find multitudes of his brothers car conductors in philadelphia immigrants of the second generation in the east side of new york iron workers in the pittsburgh region corner grocers in st louis holders of petty political jobs in atlanta and new orleans small farmers in kansas or kentucky house carpenters in ohio tinners and plumbers in chicago genuine americans all hot for the home team marchers in parades readers of the yellow newspapers fathers of families sheep on election day undistinguished norms of the homo americanus such typical americans after a fashion know english they can read it all save the hard words that is all save about ninety per cent of the words of greek and latin origin they can understand perhaps two-thirds of it as it comes from the lips of a political orator or clergyman they have a feeling that it is in some recondite sense superior to the common speech of their kind they recognize a fluent command of it as the salient mark of a smart and educated man one with the gift of gab but they themselves never speak it or try to speak it nor do they look with approbation on efforts in that direction by their fellows in no other way indeed is the failure of popular education made more vividly manifest despite a gigantic effort to enforce certain speech habits universally in operation from end to end of the country the masses of the people turn almost unanimously to very different speech habits nowhere advocated and seldom so much as even accurately observed the literary critic francis hackett somewhere speaks of the enormous gap between the literate and unliterate american he is apparently the first to call attention to it it is the national assumption that no such gap exists that all americans at least if they be white are so outfitted with sagacity in the public schools that they are competent to consider any public question intelligently and to follow its discussion with understanding but the truth is of course that the public school accomplishes no such magic the inferior man in america as elsewhere remains an inferior man despite the hard effort made to improve him and his thoughts seldom if ever rise above the most elemental concerns what lies above not only does not interest him it actually excites his derision and he has coined a unique word highbrow to express his view of it especially in speech is he suspicious of superior pretension the schoolboy of the lower orders would bring down ridicule upon himself and perhaps criticism still more devastating if he essayed to speak what his teachers conceive to be correct english or even correct american outside the schoolroom on the one hand his companions would laugh at him as a prig and on the other hand his parents would probably cane him as an impertinent critic of their own speech once he has made his farewell to the schoolmarm all her diligence in this department goes for nothing 
the boys with whom he plays baseball speak a tongue that is not the one taught in school and so do the youths with whom he will begin learning a trade to-morrow and the girl he will marry later on and the saloon keepers star pitchers vaudeville comedians business sharpers and political mountebanks he will look up to and try to imitate all the rest of his life so far as i can discover there has been but one attempt by a competent authority to determine the special characters of this general tongue of the mobile vulgus that authority is dr w w charters now head of the school of education at the university of illinois in nineteen fourteen dr charters was dean of the faculty of education and professor of the theory of teaching in the university of missouri and one of the problems he was engaged upon was that of the teaching of grammar in the course of this study he encountered the theory that such instruction should be confined to the rules habitually violated that the one aim of teaching grammar was to correct the speech of the pupils and that it was useless to harass them with principles which they already instinctively observed apparently inclining to this somewhat dubious notion dr charters applied to the school board of kansas city for permission to undertake an examination of the language actually used by the children in the elementary schools of that city and this permission was granted the materials thereupon gathered were of two classes first the teachers of grades three to seven inclusive in all the kansas city public schools were instructed to turn over to dr charters all the written work of their pupils ordinarily done in the regular order of school work during a period of four weeks secondly the teachers of grades two to seven inclusive were instructed to make note of all oral errors in grammar made in the schoolroom and around the school building during the five school days of one week by children of any age and to dispatch these notes to dr charters also the result was an accumulation of material so huge that it was unworkable with the means at hand and so the investigator and his assistants reduced it of the oral reports two studies were made the first of those from grades three and seven and the second of those from grades six and seven of the written reports only those from grades six and seven of twelve typical schools were examined the ages thus covered ran from nine or ten to fourteen or fifteen and perhaps five-sixths of the material studied came from children above twelve its examination threw a brilliant light upon the speech actually employed by children near the end of their schooling in a typical american city and per corollary upon the speech employed by their parents and other older associates if anything the grammatical and syntactical habits revealed were a bit less loose than those of the authentic volkssprache for practically all of the written evidence was gathered under conditions which naturally caused the writers to try to write what they conceived to be correct english and even the oral evidence was conditioned by the admonitory presence of the teachers moreover it must be obvious that a child of the lower classes during the period of its actual study of grammar probably speaks better english than at any time before or afterward for it is only then that any positive pressure is exerted upon it to that end but even so the departures from standard usage that were unearthed were numerous and striking and their tendency to accumulate in definite groups showed plainly the working of general laws thus no less than fifty seven per cent of the oral errors reported by the teachers of grades three and seven involved the use of the verb and nearly half of these or twenty four per cent of the total involved a confusion of the past tense form and the perfect participle again double negatives constituted eleven per cent of the errors and the misuse of adjectives or of adjectival forms for adverbs ran to four per cent finally the difficulties of the objective case among the pronouns the last stronghold of that case in english were responsible for seven per cent thus demonstrating a clear tendency to get rid of it altogether 
now compare the errors of these children half of whom as i have just said were in grade three and hence wholly uninstructed in formal grammar with the errors made by children of the second oral group that is children of grades six and seven in both of which grammar is studied dr charter's tabulations show scarcely any difference in the character and relative rank of the errors discovered those in the use of the verb drop from fifty seven per cent of the total to fifty two per cent but the double negatives remain at seven per cent and the errors in the case of pronouns at eleven per cent in the written work of grades six and seven however certain changes appear no doubt because of the special pedagogical effort against the more salient oral errors the child pen in hand has in mind the cautions oftenest heard and so reveals something of that greater exactness which all of us show when we do any writing that must bear critical inspection thus the relative frequency of confusions between the past tense forms of verbs and the perfect participles drops from twenty four per cent to five per cent and errors based on double negatives drop to one per cent but this improvement in one direction merely serves to unearth new barbarisms in other directions concealed in the oral tables by the flood of errors now remedied it is among the verbs that they are still most numerous altogether the errors here amount to exactly fifty per cent of the total such locutions as i had went and he seen diminish relatively and absolutely but in all other situations the verb is treated with the lavish freedom that is so characteristic of the american common speech confusions of the past and present tenses jump from two per cent to nineteen per cent thus eloquently demonstrating the tenacity of the error and mistakes in the forms of nouns and pronouns increase from two per cent to sixteen a shining proof of a shakiness which follows the slightest effort to augment the vocabulary of every day the materials collected by dr charters and his associates are not of course presented in full but his numerous specimens must strike familiar chords in every ear that is alert to the sounds and ways of the sermo vulgus what he gathered in kansas city might have been gathered just as well in san francisco or new orleans or chicago or new york or in youngstown ohio or little rock arkansas or waterloo iowa in each of these places large and small a few localisms might have been noted oi substituted for er in new york you all in the south a few germanisms in pennsylvania and in the upper mississippi valley a few spanish locutions in the southwest certain peculiar vowel forms in new england but in the main the report would have been identical with the report he makes that vast uniformity which marks the people of the united states in political doctrine in social habit in general information in reaction to ideas and prejudices and enthusiasms in the various details of domestic custom and dress is nowhere more marked than in language the incessant neologisms of the national speech sweep the whole country almost instantly and the iconoclastic changes which its popular spoken form are undergoing show themselves from coast to coast he hurt himself cited by dr charters is surely anything but a missouri localism one hears it everywhere and so too one hears she invited him and i and it hurt terrible and i set there and this here man and no i never neither and he ain't here and where is he at and it seems like i remember and if i was you and us fellows and he give her hell and he taken and kissed her and he loaned me a dollar and the man was found two dollars and the bee stang him and i would a thought and can i have one and he got hisn and the boss left him off and the baby at the soap and them are the kind i like 
and he don't care and no one has their ticket and how is the folks and if you would have gotten in the car you would have rode down curiously enough this widely dispersed and highly savoury dialect already as i shall show come to a certain grammatical regularity has attracted the professional writers of the country almost as little as it has attracted the philologists there are foreshadowings of it in huckleberry finn in the biglow papers and even in the rough humour of the period that began with j c neal and company and ended with artemus ward and josh billings but in those early days it had not yet come to full flower it wanted the influence of the later immigrations to take on its present character the enormous dialect literature of twenty years ago left it almost untouched localisms were explored diligently but the general dialect went virtually unobserved it is not in chimmy fadden it is not in david harem it is not even in the pre fable stories of george ade perhaps the most acute observer of average undistinguished american types urban and rustic that american literature has yet produced the business of reducing it to print had to wait for ring w lardner a chicago newspaper reporter in his grotesque tales of baseball players so immediately and so deservedly successful and now so widely imitated lardner reports the common speech not only with humour but also with the utmost accuracy the observations of charters and his associates are here reinforced by the sharp ear of one specially competent and the result is a mine of authentic american in a single story by lardner in truth it is usually possible to discover examples of almost every logical and grammatical peculiarity of the emerging language and he always resists very stoutly the temptation to overdo the thing here for example are a few typical sentences from the busher's honeymoon i and florrie was married the day before yesterday just like i told you we was going to be you was wise to get married in bedford where not nothing is nearly half so dear the sum of what i have wrote down is twenty nine dollars and forty cents alan told me i should ought to give the priest five dollars i never seen him before i didn't used to eat no lunch in the playing season except when i knowed i was not going to work i guess the meals has cost me altogether about a dollar and fifty cents and i have eat very little myself i was willing to tell her all about them two poor girls they must not be no mistake about who is the boss in my house some men lets their wife run all over them allen has went to a college football game one of the reporters give him a pass he called up and said he hadn't only the one pass but he was not hurting my feelings none the flat across the hall from this here one is for rent if we should have bought in furniture it would cost us in the neighborhood of a hundred dollars even without no piano i consider myself lucky to have found out about this before it was too late and somebody else had have gotten the tip it will always be ourn even when we move away maybe you could have did better if you had have went at it in a different way both her and you is welcome at my house i never seen so much wine drank in my life here are specimens to fit into most of charter's categories verbs confused as to tense pronouns confused as to case double and even triple negatives nouns and verbs disagreeing in number have softened to of n marking the possessive instead of s like used in place of as and the personal pronoun substituted for the demonstrative adjective a study of the whole story would probably unearth all the remaining errors noted in kansas city lardner's baseball player though he has pen in hand and is on his guard and is thus very careful to write would not instead of wouldn't and even am not instead of ain't offers a comprehensive and highly instructive panorama of popular speech habits to him the forms of the subjunctive mood have no existence 
and will and shall are identical and adjectives and adverbs are indistinguishable and the objective case is merely a variorum form of the nominative his past tense is more often than not the orthodox present tense all fine distinctions are obliterated in his speech he uses invariably the word that is simplest the grammatical form that is handiest and so he moves toward the philological millennium dreamed of by george t lanigan when the singular verb shall lie down with the plural noun and a little conjugation shall lead them End of chapter 6, part 2